We can start. So thanks for coming and welcome. And welcome particularly to our guest speaker tonight, Nicola Canelish. Um, this is the last in uh, the Women's Network series of four talks that we've had this year on how I became a dot dot dot. So tonight Nicola is going to talk about how she became Chief Executive Officer of the uh, British Youth Opera, um, a position I believe she's held for um, two years, but this is not the first time she's been in the club. She's given a talk to the uh, Wednesday Lunch Circle a couple of years ago, um, and uh, for, for her own sanity, this is uh, an evening off from her new nine-month-old baby club. <laughs> so much. Thank you, Val. Um, thanks, everyone. It's really nice to be here. And thanks to you on Zoom. Hope you can hear me all right. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the welcome. And um, Toby's only four months. Four months. So, so, uh, oh, no, don't worry. It's, um, it'll explain if I look at my phone and go, yeah, my husband, you know, he's fine. I'm sure he's fine. Um, it's great to be here. It's a lovely um, it's a lovely club. I enjoyed it the last time I was invited by Brian, the art circle. And I believe that some of you have been to see British Youth Opera's work at Opera Holland Park this summer. You brought a little party, I believe. Yes. Yeah, did you enjoy it? Yes, we did, yes. yes. So we first came two years ago, we saw Chenna Rent at 12, where she had 20 for the year. Uh, the yeah, that's good. But maybe next year, 30 or 40. Do you like your own performance all the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let me know, we can maybe arrange something. We couldn't do things like backstage tours this year because of COVID, everything was so locked down and difficult to admit anybody who wasn't absolutely necessarily in the room. Um, so much so that even the office staff didn't go to rehearsals. I was a producer for the whole thing and I never went to a single rehearsal. It was very odd. Um, but yeah, so um, so my how how I became a well, how I became the chief executive of British Youth Opera. Um, it's been an interesting journey and it's absolutely not at all where I intended to be. I I don't know if I've ever had a plan for what I wanted to be, but I'm definitely one of those people who went to university and thought, well, this is great fun. There's lots to do here. Um, and some, somewhere at the very tail end of the third year, I thought I'd better do some revision and try and pass this degree. Um, and then I did what's known as, by the young people today, as a panic masters, where you haven't really worked out what you're gonna do with your life. So you decide <laughs> to stick for a masters. Well, my panic masters somewhat grew and I've got a panic PhD, which um, again, not really sure how that happened, but um, I'll come on to that in a bit. So around the table and, and on Zoom, do, do we have opera fans? Opera fan? Opera fans? <laughs> oh, you don't have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's nice that in a women's circle to see so many men. So hi, men. Welcome. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of opera, the question I've been asked three times today, and it's usually the first question that people ask me, is do you think... No, I don't. <laughs> I can, approximately. I'm not a trained singer. Um, I did choirs and things like that at school, but no, I don't sing. Um, as I said to Brian earlier on, if he give me a few beers and um, Christmas carols, I might join in and be quite enthusiastic. Um, I started out as a, I started playing music at school, but not really, I didn't really enjoy it much until I was about 14 and I got to have a birthday money and decided to go to the music shop and put down a deposit on a saxophone um, and went home with a saxophone and, and a bill and my mum said my mum brought a saxophone she went what because she was then expected to pay for the rest of the saxophone um, which was a bit of a surprise for her, I think but ultimately that saxophone became a music GCSE, a music A level, a music BA or a PhD so it was clearly a good decision age 14 somehow I knew what I wanted to do. Um, so I run an organisation called British Youth Opera, and that is the, well, some may say the number one training organisation for young opera, everythings. You can't say singers because it is everything. It is stage managers, it's directors, designers, conductors, repetitors, costume assistants, lighting um, trainees, a lot. So basically every role you have within opera, BYO has that within its training programme. So the shows that some of you saw this summer, there was a professional director, conductor and designer, but all the singers were trainees, all of the people making the costumes, dressing, trainees, the stage management team, trainees with one professional looking after them all, purely really from a health and safety point of view in that there's a lot of dangerous things happen on stage and you do need to have that safety net of a responsible adult. 
um, although that's not a great term, responsible adult, because our trainees are usually in their mid-20s, because it takes about eight years to train to be an opera singer. So normally they'll do um, maybe a bachelor's degree in music or anything really, it, it varies. We, we have accountants, we have doctors, we have all sorts um, who have these qualifications, but then you do a two-year master's in singing, and then you do another two-year course in opera, and then... <laughs> Some people after that even go to things like the National Opera Studio, which you know of, Ted, mm. um, and that's another year. So the road to becoming a professional opera singer is a really long one. So when I say responsible adult, I can't really use that terminology in our training programs because our, a lot of our singers are nearly 30. Um, we actually have quite a few staff who are younger than the singers, which makes for an interesting dynamic in the room. So, so that's where I started and that's what I, what I am, how I got to my role. So when I, I guess what you want to know is my, my route. So please stop me and ask questions along the way. I'm very happy to, to answer. I'll just go off on a tangent. I'm sure it'd be vaguely interesting. Um, so I couldn't really decide what I wanted to do with my life when I was a teenager. I, at 14, decided that music was my life and my mum went, oh God, it's this now, is it? We've, we've tried the javelin, we've tried swimming, we've tried <laughs> all the other things and anybody with children will appreciate that. I will just buy the kit for this sport or activity and then we'll move on to the next one. But no, I stuck with it and I realised that if you play in a jazz band as a teenager, that's quite a good way of making friends and, you know, meeting young gentlemen, um, things like that. <laughs> so I had a good time doing that. and But I also enjoyed other passions. My other big passion in life is girl guiding, uh, where I volunteer and have done for more than 20 years. Um, I went. I decided that I would do music, but actually chose a university where I could have a lot of fun, do a lot of other things. So I went to Durham, which was only 13 miles from where I lived. So it was not very adventurous in that sense. But I went to this collegiate university where I, I learned to row, I played rugby, I edited yearbooks, I produced plays, I organised balls and parties and events and did charity work. And um, I did do some music at some point. I actually failed my first year of my degree and had to go back and reset them in some other things. It was an absolute <laughs> kick in the teeth because I clearly hadn't done enough work. Um, I have this annoying ability of just about scraping by on, on not that much effort in academic things. If I can read it in advance, it'll stay in my head for the short amount of time to go between the read the quickly skim read it and then the exam is right now. But any longer than that, I've got no chance. Um, I wasn't that interested in the symphonic works of um, Bizet and Berlioz, to be honest. But uh, nor was I interested in opera, incidentally, at that stage. Um, so after my first year, I did pass and I carried on and I put my ideas up a bit and it was all all right. In my second year, I discovered electronic music. Um, and I don't know if anybody knows anything about electronic music. Ellen. Ellen, electronic. 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 No. Okay. Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. yes. Um, how about the Doctor Who TV series? Right, BBC Radio Front Workshop, yes. I... One lecture really stuck in my mind, which is the one about how electronic music is made. And that sparked something in the back of my mind, which eventually became my PhD. So I told you about my panic masters and becoming the panic PhD. So I was doing some research into a guy called Hugh Davies, who had kept every piece of paper he'd ever been sent in his life. And they, when he died, his wife gave the huge amount of boxes to the British Library because she needed to have her... Um, middle floor of our house showed up because of the amount of stuff he kept in it and I, I got this little part-time job cataloging this stuff because we need someone who understands his work and I was like well I know, what he, I know what's good and what's absolute junk like train tickets and stuff so I started doing that was he, sorry was he a musician or something? He, he was a composer uh -huh. an electronic composer but he he was he was not the best electronic composer ever but his real skill was keeping stuff so <laughs> <laughs> nobody in the UK really valued electronic music that much. Like I've got a brilliant, a copy of a brilliant letter from the Arts Council in 1967 that said electronic music really isn't going anywhere, is it? Um, which one day I'll wave under their noses when I'm in need of some funding for BYO. Um, I'm just keeping it until the right day. Um, and while I was researching this, I came across a whole lot of documents about the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, which I hadn't really heard of. Being a child of the 90s, it wasn't a thing that existed in our childhood. But Doctor Who was just back on the telly. And I was, oh, Doctor Who, cool, okay. And discovered that the theme tune was written by, was credited to a man who had written by a woman. 
The woman was called Delia Derbyshire, and the man was called Ron Grainer. And Ron Grainer is always credited with the title music, the classic swoopy sounds, which led to a debate, which I ended up um, writing about my PhD, which is who should be credited with electronic music composition? Is it the person who says, do that bit after that bit, like Mozart would write the notes on the page, and then everybody else would play them? So Ron said, do that bit and then that bit. And Delia used the electronic machines to make the music. So who should be credited? She should. Well, that's what I think. <laughs> it's a short PhD, come on. Wow. Right? <laughs> well, it's nine years. <laughs> so, so there's a question, which was a, a new question at the time. It certainly was enough of a question to write a PhD on anyway, because they all have to be unique, that's the point. Um, so off I went doing that. But having discovered this archive at the British Library and spending a lot of time working on it, I needed to move from Durham to London, so I did. So it was getting silly up and down the East Coast mainline. At the same point, exactly the same point, I started teaching in Durham one day a week. So I lived in London and went back to Durham one day a week, which was entirely daft, but um, a sign of things to come as, as it's been a feature going forward. Then I needed a part-time job to support me because I was living in London, very expensive, renting a flat in Tottenham, the end of the road, somebody got shot and then, you know, <laughs> it was not, it was before the riots, but it was similar. Um, I got a job at a little opera company that is no longer with us, and I won't say the name because um, there were issues. It, it, I got an admin job in the office doing like, the most basic tasks, and I was like, this is okay, I quite enjoy this, planning, organising, lovely stuff, and at one point I went to the venue to do the show and sell the programmes and then take the money back to the office. And the production manager said to me, why do you work in the office? You'd be a brilliant stage manager. I went, huh, okay. So I went and did a bit of research. It was like, stage management, that is that thing that I did for fun at university that nobody knew what the name was of the students because we didn't ever do anything properly because we were a bunch of students. And I just thought, oh, I wish somebody had said to me when I was 17, doing all those things at school, what you're really good at is organising stuff, pulling people together, uh, getting everybody onto a schedule and writing a list of this happens now, this happens now, don't forget about this. Um, I wish someone had told me because I had no idea. And the careers advice back then was like a book, like a telephone directory of what would you like to be beginning with S, street sweeper, stage manager. Like it was like, Jesus. So I thought, right. Okay, let's be a let's be a stage manager now. And I had a bit of credit card debt from my uh, enjoyable time at university in the uh, public houses and hostelries of Durham. So I thought, right, I better pay that off. And I had a really unsupported unsupported partner, so I got rid of him, and then <laughs> <laughs> moved in with my friend. <laughs> and I sent 120 letters to get this around London. In fact, um, the Playhouse which is obviously just around the corner. I went there to see La Cage Do you know the show with the, um, it's in the, it's like a drag bar in France. They, the men dress up as can, can girls. And as I was thinking about getting rid of the unsupported partner, I, I thought, oh, I don't wanna go home. So I just bought a cheap ticket to that show. And it was the cheapest one there was, and it was on, like you'll do, I'll watch that. And I was sitting there going, I could totally work in this world. I don't need to work in this world I'm in now. I could be in the theater. And I did it. And my 120 letters that I sent to stage doors in the West End, I got three replies, um, which is about standard I know now. At the time, I was mortified. Um, and one was Phantom of the Opera that says, thank you so much for applying. I'm terribly sorry about that. I've now got three exactly the same. <laughs> Turns out for about 10 years, it's had the same rejection letter on really nice paper. <laughs> and I talked to other people in the business and they've all got one. And actually, not so long ago, I met the guy who ordered the paper. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 so many rejection letters, I need a person to order the paper. Um, I got another offer of a, like an internship. And then a show called Stomp, which was in the West End for a long time, said, do you want to come here and cover? And I thought, do you know what? This is not the show I would have picked, but I'm not going to turn this opportunity down. And I did just that. I went in for one day to learn how to do the stage left wing, which involved lots of moving things around, chucking things on stage, catching other stuff, strapping people into ski boots on top of oil drums, and um, yeah, generally just running away. And 
I started to do that and they said it's just like cover for when people are off but then somebody went on the Australian tour and somebody else went off and I ended up being there full time great this will do nicely thanks very much and then I had enough credits I could join equity I was a stage manager so all my 10 years I did loads of different things went all over the world um, never stayed in one place very long I at one point, I rented a flat in London and in, in one year, slept there for 30 nights. So I got rid of that. Um, I went to, I've, I've just been all over the place. So my, I put my top ones there. I did a show of 42nd Street at the London Palladium uh, for charity, for the Karen Keating Foundation, which is a cancer charity. And we had 120 tap dancers. All did it, everyone did it for, voluntarily. Um, and honestly, 120 tap dancers is criminal. It should not be allowed. It's so loud. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, thanks very much. It's lovely because you do it quieter. And, um, and there's a song in 42nd Street called Names. Mm. So they got a whole lot of famous women in. <laughs> and, we had, and most of them were so famous they couldn't be bothered to turn to the rehearsal, which was quite amusing because Vanessa Phelps nearly fell off the stage because she'd worn shoes, she couldn't walk, and they didn't realise she had to come down a big staircase. <laughs> bit of an error. Um, and Wayne Smith is really very small, very small, um, nearly fell over him. And <laughs> got found a nice guy, we had a nice conversation about shoes. Um, so that was good fun. Uh, one night only, took three weeks to prepare and it was all over in seconds. And it was probably the most high adrenaline experience of my life because Half these people haven't been to the rehearsal, there's so many of them, you sort of have to corral them in pens. And I just had various stage management staff like saying, right, you take that group over there and bring them when I need them. Um, and everybody had to come on one side and go off the other, because otherwise there would have been mass congestion. And I don't know if you've been backstage at the Palladium, but it's tiny. Mm. It does not have that like huge, glorious front. Well, it does have the front, but the back is like little rabbit warrens, um, which is really good fun and kind of glamorous in its own way. Um, on the other flip side, I did a Shakespeare's Globe tour where we went to some really exotic places, but what, the one that sticks in my mind was in Romania, where we did the show in the courtyard of a school that had bullet holes in the wall from the genocide, and it was just chilling to the bone of just, just there, boom. and you didn't really know what it was, you thought it was a bit run down until you really thought about it. Terrifying. And on that same tour, we went to St. Lucia, which everyone goes, yeah, that sounds right. Yes, I'll come to St. Lucia. No, thanks. Um, well, you've got a stage crew of guys who are all absolutely stoned, just like picking up bits of your scenery, like one-handed. Like, Please don't break it, me, you, put it down, thanks. Um, and doing a show in, in the rainforest, which was phenomenal. It was a really beautiful experience, but um, really hot, really buggy. Um, I was very glad to come home from St. Lucia. And the final one that tour was in Hamlet's Castle in Denmark, which was very cool, uh, except that we had a trailer. So the idea with the Shakespeare Globe tour was that it was a, a trailer stage, so it was about as long as this actually, but you toured that behind a transit van and you had to pass the trailer touring driving test in order to do it. It took me three goals, but I did pass it. None of my colleagues did, so I had to do all the towing. It's quite annoying, I should have not passed it, it would have been much easier. Um, but I have got that toy license, which was fab until about two weeks ago when they decided you didn't need a license at anymore. So anyway, I can reverse park a trailer in a service station car park, so I'm fine with that. Can you drive a night stream? No, that's, that's a different category license. My next one I want is minibuses. It's going to take more than seven people in a vehicle. I feel that'd be useful in my life. But it's about a thousand pounds, so I haven't done it yet. Um, so Hamlet Castle has a like corkscrew shaped passageway to go from the moat, like in the entranceway, up to like the centre courtyard. And we had this big long trailer stage. I said it took about an hour to go about 200 metres on this kind of thing, but we got there. And and people say to you, oh, stage manager must be really glamorous. It's an awful lot of like reversing trailers around corners and high vis jackets and traffic cones and putting bits of foam on the corner of things. Um, yeah, so there we go. And um, I did 10 years of this. And I, I finished that off with a, a day called International Stage Managers Day, which happens every year in October. It was actually yesterday. And on the very first one, the social media said, put out, you know, tell us your pictures, show everything you're doing, tag us in this thing. Okay, great. So I was doing an opera, an English touring opera, um, who were in the headlines at the minute for other reasons. 
And there was a magic trick, which is a, like a book that caught on fire and did this effect. On this show, uh, the fire leapt out of the book, down to the floor, and set the singer's trouser leg on fire. <laughs> and it was a day where three people were off, so we had three covers on, and they were all a complicated surname. So I'd had to say Mr. Thornton was off, but Mr. Thornton was singing. And they were, I mean, they were all either Russian or Czech. Uh, it was a mouthful. So I had my black suit on, nice, smart, gone out in front of the curtain, said, sorry about this, these people are on, these people are off, lovely, thanks very much. Gone back through the curtain, was literally stripping off in the wings, out of the jacket, out of the nice trousers, putting on the grubby ones so I could crawl about on the stage. And the other stage manager comes over the cans, the headset, and says to me, Nicola, I think he's on fire. So I thought, are you sure? Is it not just a crap camera? Because often those cameras are a bit bumpy and you're never quite sure. No, no, he was on fire. Trousers back on, ditched the jacket, thought it wasn't necessary, got the fire thing, which I ran out on stage, put out the fire, got a round of applause. He's like, thanks very much. <laughs> Are you all right? Can you carry on to want to stop? He's like, no, I'm fine, I'll carry on, but maybe we won't do the trick. I was like, yeah, give me that. Um, went back on, had a you know little curtain call at the end, that was fun. Um, and that was stage management, which was fun. Um it was fun, I learned lots of stuff, I learned lots of Skills that you can't really write on a job description, or a, they're those skills that you learn without having names for them. It's how to keep three different things running in your head at the same time, and someone's talking in the ear about something, talking to them, and irrelevance. You can't offend them, so it's not really important. And those skills all went with me to becoming chief exec. Next, I thought, I went with this. This was about 2014. I thought, Okay, I met a nice man now, not the one I got rid of earlier on, but probably time to settle down. If I want to see him ever, I better stop touring and actually go home to my flat. So I decided to get a job in education and I um, worked at the Royal Academy of Music, we're in the opera department. So I was the person doing all of the admin, the management, the producing the shows, uh, while there was one figurehead conductor. So it was Jane Glover initially, and then a guy called Gareth Hancock, who was later dismissed for Google him. Um, that was an interesting time in my life. It, I'm glad it is more spoken about now because when before that incident, I don't think anybody really acknowledged me too in relation to opera, but they do now, so that's good. Um, got to the Royal Academy of Music, but this job will do nicely for a couple of years. It's paid maternity leave, brilliant, all that sort of stuff. Great. Okay, certainly. I've been there about six months, and they said, so we're knocking the theatre down next year, and the whole of the opera department is going to have to go off site. And a lot of people thought, oh, this is an absolute disaster. How will it ever work? And I thought, no, this is going to be great. Um, so off we went on tour, but around London. So I got to be on tour and in London. And um, we, did all, we did a venue called Amberger P3, which is in the University of Westminster, underneath the university, it's like below ground level. And it's a huge empty chamber where they used to test concrete for um, stress fractures and things. And it was where they built a bit of the channel tunnel to test it before they built it in the ground. Which was great fun, but I mean... Is that on the Euston Road? Yeah. yeah right. It's like opposite the academy and a tiny bit towards Baker Street. Yeah. Really unassuming front. And underneath you would not know there was anything. No. Massive. Yeah. And it was cavernous. And um, we were like, you doing an opera in here? Um, and when well, yes, Brian came and said, so we would be singing this from here with these nice tiled walls. Imagine that, but like huge. Um, so we had to not just design a set to go on the stage, we had to build dressing rooms, we had to hire toilets, we had to build a seating back, we had to uh, drape the whole thing in black serge so that some of the sound was absorbed. It was a massive install project that took six weeks and it became, the job became far more than just putting some singers into some coachings and have some lessons so let's do some nice shows, that'd be lovely. Um, but it whet my appetite for producing operas and I didn't expect to learn that skill in that job and I'm very glad I did. I didn't stop to have a baby at that point while there was paid maternity leave, though. that was a bit of an error. Um, <laughs> where, where have we got to in the list? So, paid maternity leave is not a good reason to have a baby. <laughs> well, so what happened next is we got back to the Royal Academy to open the new theatre mm. two years late because the builders obviously left longer. Um, and 
I was sitting in a meeting, but everyone was talking about the opening night of the theatre. And it's like, and Princess Anne will do this and sit here and this will happen. And I thought, well, this is marvellous. Has anybody thought about how Princess Anne's going to get to there at that time, doing this, doing that, doing that? And I thought, I just said, is anyone organising this? And the very senior person at the academy said, yes, they're in the kitchen, they did this, they did this. I said, is anybody bringing everybody together here? Because this is otherwise going to be a total disaster. Um, I ended up doing it. So there is a photo of me in Getty Images where you can just see my head behind like an ornamental flower thing in a big pot and Princess Anne's coming past. And I honestly, I had so I had two radios. I had a stage radio and a front of house radio, one in each ear and so many cables that I had to, in a ball dress. So I had to go to the wardrobe and say, help me out. So they gave me a belt, put my two cans packs on. Then I looked a bit like a suicide bomber. <laughs> so then they wrapped me in like a, a shawl thing. So I, but then the shawl has to wear my arms. I couldn't leave my arms. <laughs> so my two radios, my earpieces. I was like, okay, I'll talk to everybody. I can't really do more than this. Um, it was it was really good fun. But I, everyone else was like, oh, is it marvellous? And I'm just so proud of the fact that I got about seven departments to talk to each other. Everything ran totally smoothly. Princess Anne came in, had a, you know, sat down in a nice royal chair and it was gorgeous. There were drinks after. Um, and then I thought, well, I've done now. Better finish this job. I, there's literally no more I can do with this. So I, I left and I'd, I went to BYO. There was a job called the general manager. I thought, that sounds good. It's, I'm ready to leave Brown. Off we go. And I've been there a few months and my boss at the time, who was the, the former executive director, was just getting a bit slower. Turned out he wasn't very well. And within a few months of me arriving, he was on very long term sick leave, which led to his ultimate um, retirement. So this was just two weeks short of a year from the day the pandemic started. So I was thrown in at the absolute deep end two weeks before the pandemic. So my autobiography is going to be called and then there was the pandemic. I really didn't think anything else could happen to me in the first year of being chief exec. Uh, we lost our free office in about three weeks. Uh, we, I lost a couple of staff who hadn't been happy in the time when my predecessor was not running things because he wasn't well and nobody had noticed. Um, we had a training program that had been the same for 30 years and really needed a kick of the bum. Um, we had venues that were terrible. I mean, the Peacock Theatre, some of you will have been, is just, you go down the steps and down a bit more and your soul is sucked from you as you get further and further down. Um, it's too big, you can't sell enough tickets to make it look nice and lots, lots of stuff needed to be done. Um, and we were getting there. I was, I'd become this chief exec and it was all right. And then the pandemic struck and I had, on the 6th of March 2020, I had my strategy approved for the 2020-23 period. And on the 16th of March, 10 days later, it was in absolute tatters. What time is it? Probably about time to stop. So there you go. Uh, I haven't told you about my other passion, but I'll tell you about that if you're interested. Any questions? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I've written a couple of notes down. I spent some time in um, Australia, and BYO for me was bring your own. Mm. Just to <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. Bring your own uh, bottle of wine to the other um, side of an asset. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, from your description of what it takes to actually become an opera singer, it seems to me that becoming a doctor is an uh, easier option. It is, yes. Yeah. 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 So, any questions, anybody? But um, becoming an opera singer, you say, take eight years. Um, but I, I know, or at least know, having seen over the years the um, Glyndebourne um, Opera, you know, where they have people, I mean, some of those singers from abroad are certainly under under 30. I mean, some of them are sort of 22 or 24, you know, I don't know how long they've been. Perhaps they started there when they were. Well, that, yeah, depends. So in the UK, that's the sort of accepted training model of what you need to do to get to the next stage. There are flaws in it, and in some people's opinion, it's too long. Um, in some countries, if you're talented, just go and get a job. At opera houses will employ mm -hmm. you. Um, in the UK, there's a quite a good safety net of the voice. Your body needs to finish growing before you start using your voice in that way, because it's a, it's all muscles. So particularly boys, if they haven't finished 
developing. Like some lads don't finish school until about 25. So if that is the case, you really shouldn't be training that voice to that level until it's done. With sopranos um, and mezzos with, of women, the body can finish growing at like 15 or 16. So there is a, like a, you can do it a lot sooner. There are unfortunately quite a lot of cases of young adults being pushed too hard too soon and their voice is done by the time they're 35, they're finished, like spoiled it basically. So I think the, the UK training is in such that you build up the stamina to have your career for longer. But it, it really does vary worldwide. What's the oldest thing you've ever had? In BYO? Mm -hmm. 40. He was a bass. And he his voice only became a bass when he was in his late 20s. I don't know, I'm just kept getting older. <laughs> and uh, he went through that process of realising he, he knew he was a good singer. He did like choral work, singing in cathedral choirs and things like that. And then was like, oh, all right, actually, this is going somewhere. Had it got a teacher again and and then was entering the profession, having had a, t a whole other performing career beforehand. Where do you think BYO uh, sits? In the, it's now quite a big, um, I can't think of the right word, ecology around, you know, like uh, when the, what is now in the Toronto studio started, it's called the London Opera Centre, and there wasn't training for opera singers, really, probably not any of the Royal Colleges or anything else. So it was an at the time, but that was 30 years ago. Exactly. And not only, has it, it and it only takes 12 singers a year whatever. but you know the um a lot of the uh, opera companies have started their own young artist programs yes. so where does byo sit in this um ecology yeah, the, the ecosystem, ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it could work like it a lot okay. um so byo's mission is to bridge the gap between training and the profession so training is different for everybody and, and where you're your, you know, where you enter training and where you leave training it can be at totally different ages. You can go to college in London or in Glasgow or a different country, or you can come from a different country. Yeah. Um, so if you, for example, go to the Royal College of Music in London, you will be doing your stage performances with people you know, in a rehearsal room that you know, fitting into a schedule that is an academic schedule. So you might have class on a Monday morning, then you might see a lesson, then a bit of rehearsal and some things. So that doesn't actually mirror what you're going to get in the profession. It doesn't really help you 100% to become ready for work. So to be ready for work, you need to turn up on day one, not knowing anybody with the right shoes, score, water, mask these days, um, and attitude to go, right, we've got four weeks in the rehearsal room, then we're on stage, then we go, boom, done. Whereas in college, it will take you a lot longer because they mix other bits of training in with it. Okay. Well, they did at the academy anyway. Yeah, fine. Believe that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't fully make you business ready. And also, the repertoire they choose at college is, say they might do Figaro, which will allow three or four singers to really shine. Um, and then generally on the college courses, they take three sopranos, three mentors, three baritones, three tenors, and maybe a tax tenor. Just if you look at the draw, a singer can always be passed over for the good roles, and they may never, in their two years of opera school, get the role they really want. Yeah. And BYO tends to feature those singers more. They tend to be the ones who get the, like, yeah. feature Are they the ones that apply, and the ones that were passed over at the Royal Academy? Well, four, that go well, I'm going for BYO. Well, 400 singers generally apply each year. Okay. For about 20 principal roles, depending, 15 to 20. So it varies from what opera we choose. We tend, tend to not choose um, the opera before we've heard the auditions because mm -hmm. sometimes you get in the in the shortlist there's always something that's got tenors in it and tenors are the, the absolute shortage skill shortage industry if you want a career if you want to be a, a tenor a good one you will work all the time it's just it just doesn't happen often mm -hmm. and with the boy voices again men find out they're suitable later on and the whole thing just sketched onto that but there's an endless soprano so we'll always chuck in a bit of Swar Angelica or Carmelites because a lot of them is a lot of sopranos. Um, so we have like a short list of five operas and we'll hear the auditions and we'll go, well, we could cast that one. And we could, apparently, I don't, I've never done this, but my um, director of training says, we can always cast I don't know this, never a problem. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, don't fancy doing that, but never mind. Um, so then we'll hear the auditions and then we'll decide what is the best fit and what 
will give the most benefit. So the train, the remit for us is not who's the best, but who will benefit most from the training, which is often that person who perhaps hasn't had the opportunity they should. So why do you take that as your remit? Sorry. Probably just as where it's landed. Can Emma wanted to, she can't switch a camera on apparently, but oh, Emma right. want, Emma's got a question. Is that written down? You better have. Right. It is. Can you unmute, Emma? Uh, oh, right, there you go. What advice would you give to others wishing to follow in your footsteps? What would you wish you would know? Good question. Thank you, Emma. Um, I wish I'd know that you don't have to follow a set path. There is no compulsory route for life. You can do it whatever way you want. Um, I wish I had known that I could be more forceful in that, particularly with my family, to say, no, Mum, I don't need a job now, nor do I need to get married right now. Uh, all of these things can wait. Um, I also wish I had known that academic year groups from school stop at 18. Nobody cares, or nobody should care. And it doesn't give you more status to be a third year than be a first year. If you're a first year and you want to do that thing, just do the thing. Like, don't worry that you're waiting your turn for when you get to the third year. Or, and that, you know, in my job, I became the chief executive at 35, which was very young for opera. Everybody else was an older white man in a suit who was probably nearly 70. And I used to was in rooms like this and just had to get on with it. So I know where I got that from. And that's from girl guiding. That's from volunteering, working with teenage girls and being able to stand up in a room and just control the place and, and have the ability and the confidence just to speak to the room. So yeah, you don't have to follow any rules and year groups don't matter. If you can remember being at school, it was really important. Like the end, the, the further up the train, chain you got, you've got more responsibility. So yes, I hope that answers your question, Emma. I don't know if she'll say anything. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. It's not just statistics you've got of how many people have successfully gone into the profession after having been part of um, We know there are 5,500 alumni, yeah. and we know there are at least 1,000 working in singing. Um, we haven't done like a deep dive into those mm -hmm. stats because that 1,000 or so are the ones that you hear about, like the mm -hmm. more famous, the more well-known, or just like the job and performance that we know about. But we haven't gone on to look at who became a successful singing teacher, for example, or, or a stage manager. Well, we, yeah, we haven't looked outside the singing roles because, yeah. well, I know of two stage managers at EN who went to BYO mm. and wouldn't have become opera stage managers if they hadn't done BYO because for the non-singing roles, opera isn't really taught. So we go to college to be a stage manager, you do a degree in it, you wouldn't necessarily learn about opera unless you went to the Guildhall or the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, because they're the only ones where there's crossover between the two. Um, if you go to RAD, no opera. If you go to um, quite a few other places, there's no opera. So we, we partnered in the past. Actually, when I was at RAM, we partnered with RADA to introduce the two to each other. And it worked really well, and it's still going now. Um, it's a, it's a lot. It's a high number. But that's, that's probably great. that's great. It's good, but it's probably because of as it sort of return, refer back to what you were saying. When they come to us, they're all they're ready to go. Mm. We shouldn't have any tough ones really, because that they're at the end of their training. Mm. So, so who's your competition then? So we didn't fully answer the ecosystem question. No, we've gone for hours. Yes, I did a map if you like. <laughs> um, so it's an amoeba. Yeah. So we, basically, if you so. Anyway, all opera would have like a chorus role. Ideally, this year, ignore this year because it was cool, but it was complicated. Chorus roles, cover roles, principal roles. So as a junior singer aged maybe 19 or 20, might get a place in the chorus. Great, learn stagecraft, help to learn language, things like that. And then you reapply the next year or the year after, you might get to cover one of the principal roles. Uh, and then a year or two later, you may get to be the principal role yourself. So the things like Garsington and Glyndebourne of Young Artist Programmes generally give uh, positions to chorus positions. And from that chorus, you will, you'll get paid, which is mm. not what BYO do, but you'll be paid to sing in the chorus. You might then cover 
unlikely a glam one, but you might cover. And in that could and then you might get to go on. And if you went on, that would be the coup. That would be the absolute winner you've missed, you know, as long as you did a good job. And you get well paid for that show that you did. Um, but at BYO, you are given the chance to do the full role that you would never get near at the likes of Glenbourne, Gossington, et cetera. So there is that. It gives you that showcase when you need it most. Um, and it's a safe environment. It has a backup. We try and treat everyone as if it's the real thing and make it you will be on time and you will be prepared and all of that. But with a sort of warm, fuzzy layer that if you really need it, we're here for you. Otherwise, we're going to gently push you out the nest and sort of tip you over the edge so that you fly. But it's only those two, or there are there other young artists? So most, most opera companies have a young artist program now. Some of them, sadly, are exploitative, where they're giving either low pay or no pay to a chorus um, and calling them young artists, but not providing anything in the way of training. Do you mean like opera norms? Or no, they're fine. Um, some smaller companies that um, I don't want to name anyone, but there are a lot of small companies. So. I call, yes. so there's the big six, which is ENO, ROH, Glyndebourne Opera North, Welsh National Opera and Scottish Opera. They're the big companies. They all have good, well-established, suitable young artists programmes. And then the big summer festival, Garthington, Glyndebourne, Grange Festival, Grange, Park, Holland Park, uh, Buxton have decent young artists programmes. Yeah. If I haven't mentioned their name, <laughs> <laughs> do your own research on that one. Okay. Yeah, but I could tell you in much more detail if you're interested. I know. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I may need big paper and coloured pens. I'm amazed at the number of people that you were talking about that are going into opera. Is that growing or is it decreasing? It's decreasing at the minute. Because of the because of education? Because, mm -hmm. not... because of Brexit. Mm -hmm. Oh really? Yes. This is the it's not a proven statistic yet, but um the access to education for opera has really dried up. Um, because of free movement. So something that a lot of opera singers aspire to would be do their college, get to the end of it, do BOI on a principal role, maybe get a London agent, fab, um, and then go and do a young artist programme in Germany, because in Germany they have heaps of them. Every city has an opera house with a really good young artist programme where they get lessons and coaching, they'll do small roles, they get a good salary. Okay, yeah. It's a really good thing, but it hasn't, um, it, it's impossible to get the visa at the minute to go. So there are people still there who started like a way, a way back because I give you a couple of years contract. Um, so there are singers now who, I mean, largely singers, have a what's called a portfolio career now, where you are a singer and singing teacher, yoga teacher, accountant, doctor, like anything really, as long as you can fit it together. Um, so it's it's not a good place at the minute for performing arts in general. But that's not just opera; right there, all performing arts. And is it, is it not, would it not be true that, I mean, places like the Royal Academy Royal, uh, the, uh, the other um, major schools, I mean, they used to get a, a lot of their income from foreign students, yes. uh, which are no longer presumably coming. Um, well, I don't know any statistics about that, but... Um, uh, certainly the academy, it wouldn't be European students, it'd be usually Asian, Australian, Chinese, South African, who pay an awful lot well, to come. Yes. They're not coming at the minute because they can't get in because of COVID. So there is, there is going to be a strange few years, followed by a sort of shaken out period where everyone sort of resettles, works out where things fit. And it's an interesting time to be involved, but it's a rocky time. How is BYO funded? Ah, so we are an Arts Council National Portfolio Organisation in Band 1, which means we don't get an awful lot of money from them, which is, we get 40 grand, which is nice. Um, we have uh, private donors uh, who can adopt singers, who can become part of our chairman's circle. So you can become a friend of BYO for 50 quid, or you can join the chairman's circle for five grand, and there's everything in between. Um, and then we have custom foundations, which are tailored to specific things. So it's, for example, in two years is a Ralph Vaughan Williams anniversary, and there'll be a lot of money around that year to do Vaughan Williams work. Um, and there's usually work for, if you can involve some children from a disadvantaged community, that always brings in some money. Um, 
there are different avenues to explore. It's hard though at the minute. Um, it's been, we've actually been running it a lot for about seven years um, because a very nice lady left us an awful lot of money and said, please spend this at BYO. BYO went, yes, please, that's great. <laughs> so it's, it's really tricky. But yeah, that's how we funded. Um, and in summer 21, for the very first time, we had a box office income we could rely on, um, which was £75,000, which we'd never had anything like that before. I had a good deal with a venue and a good box office. So setting us up for the future. And Brian doesn't need to ask a question because I have remembered. Um, Taking off our fundraising year with a concert in, on the 5th of November, uh, conducted by Dame Jane Glover, with Sarah Connolly, Dame mm -hmm. Sarah Connolly, mm -hmm. um, and Benedict Nelson, who's not a Dame, um, <laughs> who is a fabulous baritone, doing the Marla and the Vaughan Williams at John Smith Square with the South Bank Symphonia. And they are our orchestra partners, and they're also a uh, sort of graduate slash training orchestra. So they take a full orchestra, for one year after they graduated and like kind of like we do get them ready for the profession hmm. and spit them out so we're doing that um with the aim of entertaining some new high level donors selling some tickets and kick-starting our 2022 fundraising year on 5th of november at st john smith square it'll be good fun and dame felicity lot is going to be there too who is our president outgoing will be succeeded by our new president, who I'm not going to tell you it is. You'll find out anyway. <laughs> and we have a specific person doing sponsorship. Yeah, we've got three people working in fundraising. Yeah. Um, my, I've got a staff of nine, but everyone is, like, is part-time in a different way. So the lady who works in individual giving um, for me, Anna, is an a international soprano, Anna Passamon. She is, I don't know, you may have seen the lady who wore the gold dress with the blue EU flag as a belt at the Albert Hall and took it off and waved it. That's Anna Passamon, who is our fundraising consultant for individual donors. Um, she, so she deals with the people and Carla and Freya deal with trusts. So, um, yeah, they're all part-time in some way different. So Anna fits around singing around fundraising and Carla works lots of different people. Do, do you have any corporate sponsorship? No, we don't. We're, we're entertaining a client at the minute who we hope will become a corporate sponsor. But if you know anyone, send them away. <laughs> <laughs> we're basically all our organisations at the minute are absolutely shamelessly going, have you got any money? We would like to please. Thank you. We're very nice. And we can give you lovely offer at the end. Or you can adopt an artist and you get to keep them for all six weeks, and then you have to give them back. <laughs> Are you still involved with the Girl Guiding? I am. Yes. So I'm an ambassador for Girl Guiding in London and the South East, um, which I got because I'm a, I was a young chief exec and they thought that this was a great way to say to young women who have been there mm -hmm. like age 10 to like 25, you can do whatever you want. Um, yes, I run a group for 14 to 18 year olds in North London, and I run a, a different group also in North London, which is flexible for girls who can't attend for any any sort of normal week to week reasons. We just do adventures. Been all over the world, um, Hong Kong, Costa Rica, Switzerland, um, and we're going to the very glamorous location of Kent next year um, for a jamboree. Because there isn't much international travel at the moment, so we thought we'd have a just have one in the UK. Yeah, it's um, definitely doing girl guiding may just gave me that confidence to just if I can control a group of seven year old brownies, like you are. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great thing. You said, um, when you in the past or still perhaps sit down with um, people doing this same job and nearly all white not middle-aged, but elderly mm -hmm. gentlemen. Yes. Um, I mean, is there any, do you feel there's any changes happening there? Because I mean, I know a little about music, but I've noticed, I mean, you know, now, um, you know, the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra actually has women in it. And, you know, um, there's now, well, a fair number of very good women conductors, you know, mm -hmm. um, sort of they are coming you know as women networking i just think i mean i went to the duggan hall for the first time uh last week and there was a an estonian woman you know conducting the royal philharmonic um you know i i, I didn't know that who, who it was going to be and suddenly this blonde 
lady comes out, you know, conducting, and we know like Mirka and people like that, you know, that, that, you know, and what's her name? Kamiya. Uh, oh, there's the um, other Finnish con conductor, woman conductor. You'll think of it later, Peter, when you're not thinking about it. It'll come to you when you're not thinking about it. Well, I mentioned Jane Lovett earlier on. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Jane was the first, well, she probably wasn't the first female conductor in the UK. There were probably plenty of us before her, but she was the first one who really became anything. So she yeah. was a conductor of Blind Wall Tour after she became it. And she had a series on the BBC called Jane Lovett and the Orchestra in the 80s. I would love to see that. I, I don't know if anyone's got any contacts for BBC to go and delve and dig that out. Um, it's definitely getting better, but it's... Uh, there's a phrase, somebody like me. So if you see nobody like you on that stage, how likely are you as a teenager to go into that as a field? Mm -hmm. So the more people who sit, like the more women who are represented in those fields, and it goes for other characteristics as well. And there are nine protected characteristics of diversity, which are ethnicity, um, gender identity, yeah, sexuality. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, do, I know all of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's two more as well. There's socioeconomic uh, upbringing, yeah. like the, mm -hmm. how, what your parents did for a living when you were 10 years old, that kind of thing, and where you live in the country. Um, I, one of the things I found hardest about being the only woman in the room was my accent. Mm -hmm. It was nothing to do with the fact that I was a woman because I'd gone over that. I could deal with that. It was that... People do sometimes struggle to understand me. And when I was working as a stage manager, I definitely dumbed my accent down a bit because you're working on quite poor quality radios. So it wasn't because I didn't care. It was because you have to be able to make yourself understood. Um, and also working in opera, English is not always people's first language. If you roll in there with a hefty Geordie accent to some poor Italian girl, you've got no chance to tell me. Yeah, so it's getting better, but... Um, I mean, Elaine Padmore ran the Royal Opera in the late 90s into the early noughties, and she's on our board at the moment, and she just said, like, there was no movement on more women, there was just more men. And now, I think a man may struggle to get a high-level job in opera, because I suspect the next round of recruitment for any of the big opera companies will be a woman who isn't white. If you can find a woman who isn't white, <laughs> because opera is disgustingly white. Uh, there are so many barriers to participation and so many points. Like the National Opera Studio, which you know of, has a brilliant thing called the funnel chart, which shows the funnel for when people drop off and when people are no longer interested in opera. So you start with this group by wide group of kids aged 16, 17, going, great, I'm going to work in opera, it's fat. And it just fritters away into yeah. like this tiny group who conservatoire educated, probably went to private school, parents could afford singing lessons. Therefore, you're already into basically white middle class and, and above. So BYO working with the National Opera Studio on that project to change, like BYO next year are going to actually become youth. So to, to round up where I was going with your, what, who do you serve, where do you sit? Everyone thinks BYO is kids mm. because it's youth. National mm. Youth Theatre, you know, National Youth Choir of Great Britain are all for under 21s. I think NYT goes up to 25, but BYO doesn't actually do anything with anybody under the age of about 21. So we're going to start a programme for younger voices. We're going to find those people like that. When the chat, the funnel is wide and people haven't thought, this isn't for me, we're going to go around the country and do workshops in different towns to get those kids interested. And then crucially, we're going to keep them interested by a support network for a year after they've taken part in the workshop. Because I hate outreach work, where you go to a school for a week, you do a project, the kid goes, I love opera, this is great. Opera disappears. No more. <laughs> and what was the point? They had a good time, but it, yeah. at least follow it up. Yeah. So to become, and, and also to become an online signposting service where if you Google, I want to be an opera singer in the UK, you go to the Royal Opera as a website, for some, that's just where you get, there isn't anything more explicit than that. Um, so be why you're going to become future insane. Adrian, yeah. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier about the lack of tenors, mm. um, I used to sing a basso profundo a long time ago. Ah. And there are not many basso profundos around these days. There's a sort of lack of um, men in general, but I was thinking part of the equalities question you were raising there around the LGBTQ um, community in opera, which is 
not something which necessarily is that well linked together. Mm. Is that another area that you might potentially want to try and explore a bit further? Yeah, so the LGBTQ plus community is growing in traction in opera at the moment. There are a few transgender singers out there who have become quite well known because people are giving them work, which is fabulous. Um, we haven't had anyone at BYO yet who has applied that we're aware of in that community. We're also not aware of anyone who is hidden transgender because if you don't tell us, we might not know. Um, but we are looking towards a new model of auditions in the new year, which will be what's called by voice alone and by submission of audio recording. So when you're being assessed in the first wave by the panel, all they get is your voice. They can't see you, they don't know where you live, they don't know what college you went to, they don't know who your teacher is, or who your daddy is, you know, none of that. Excellent. Do you want to plug your next talk, Derek? I was going to ask first, <laughs> but we have, a, um, on October 25th, with, uh, Derek uh, Tobias is doing a talk about his history in the theatre. Um, and stage development and around his LGBTQ lifestyle. He's 90 this year, so it'll be his birthday. Oh! Um, and it will be, I'm very much looking forward to the, that talk. So for those of you who perhaps haven't signed up, there are um, most people I'm bored. Table, <laughs> bored. I thought you might be. I'm sure some of the others around the table are as well. Uh, but if you aren't, um, just contact me and we'll get them out. Oh, super, thank you. Yeah. And he has worked in the Royal Opera House as an actor. Yeah. Oh! Fun. Yeah, also yeah. in the Royal Ballet in long dancing roles. Yes. Oh, they're great roles where you have to go on as like the priest or something. Yeah, yes, yes that's like right. Or pretended to play a banjo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ben, no, he's, a, he's a lovely man. He's a fairly new member of the club, yes. but he's a lovely man. Oh, great. Yeah, nice to talk up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a sort of question, but um, I'm staying for dinner. Oh, carry on. But the, my last one is on the, on the theme of this evening. So, do you. Do you think the qualities that you uh, of being a stage manager transfer relatively easily to being a chief executive or? Yes. So the chief executive of NOS was also a struggling all the balls, isn't it? Yeah. So Emily, who runs the national yes, team, is, was also a stage manager. Yes. So Emily and I met, Emily was my mentor actually, um, before I became chief exec. Uh, we had a really long chat about this and then we looked around the business and there's a lot of former stage management in leadership positions, male and female, mm. but generally speaking, good stage management are straight women or gay men. There is something yeah. about straight men that are so good at it. Communication skills. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it, it's just one of those things and I must admit I know one straight male stage manager and many women and gay men. So. Interesting, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. I'm not sure that I don't know what the statistics would be about the chief execs of opera companies, but I don't um, wouldn't think there are a lot of them are gay men. There are not a lot of women either, but in the arts in general, yeah. um, there are a lot of former stage management in leadership. But also people who did it for about five years and it's dropped off the bottom of their CV and it doesn't get mentioned, so you have to know like who they are. And you have to go, oh, actually, he was a stage manager for like five years, 25 years ago. It's not always easy to work out, but like yeah. Sarah Playfair, who's a casting director, mm -hmm. um, does Dartington and quite a few other places, was a stage manager. Right. Um, yeah, they're, they're all over the place. <laughs> I think the dining room is expecting us any Ooh. time now. So oh, if right. I could just come over to Brian to. Oh, thank well. you both. Well, we really appreciate you coming along today. And thank you. Very you. much appreciated. And I'm sure we will have to be at the Opera House. Make all this happen. And we know there's a lot going on backstage, but we don't fully appreciate it. So it's good to have these insights. And I've only appeared on the opera stage once, but we'll save that for dinner. <laughs> 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 so it's very much thank you for coming along. I will be coming to the in November. Fabulous. And I look forward to next year's performances. Oh, thank you. Very much. <laughs>